We're talking this morning uh, here with Vic Cooley. He was the lead increment scientist for Expeditions 33 and 34. Vic, uh, appreciate uh, hanging with us as we've waited to uh, find out uh, when this is going to happen. Uh, let's start by getting you to explain what this small satellite deployer demonstration is all about. Well, thank you, Pat. Uh, uh, good morning to you. Yes, it's a pretty exciting day to be here in the flight control room. Uh, the demonstration of the small sat deployment system is all about uh, adding yet one more capability to our wonderful space station. You know, the, uh, the small sat, or otherwise known as CubeSat, that design was actually uh, engineered by Cal Poly back in 1999, and uh, it included a deployer. Now JAXA has, has modified that slightly and has launched it to the space station on the HTV uh, vehicle earlier this summer, and now there are five satellites there, and they will be ejected when we get to this activity, which is now probably postponed because of the ATV situation and the dam. Um, but it, it is to demonstrate that capability from a permanently manned uh, orbiting vehicle. Uh, so far, these satellites have been uh, ejected from uh, non-manned vehicles, which are uh, very expensive to launch. And the whole idea is about lowering cost. If we can lower the cost by these payloads being a secondary payload on a, a, a rocket, or in this case, on the HTV, which is already carrying cargo to the space station, then that makes it even lower cost for these small sats to be deployed. So it, it's a matter of, of expense as well as, uh, as the efficacy of deploying them. You don't have to have a dedicated rocket to launch what's really a small payload. That's correct. And. Uh, you know, we, we, we want to continue lowering the cost as much as possible. The, the cost was lowered substantially just by having this design that we've had over the last 10 years. And, and many small sats have already been launched that way from unmanned vehicles. We would like to have that capability from the space station also. It's possible to conceive that you might want to have satellites ready to go that needed some kind of uh, tweaking or adjustment before you launch them. They could be positioned on the space station and then that adjustments, mechanical adjustments could be made by the crew members before they launch them for such dedicated purposes as as, as uh, monitoring uh, disasters or other natural events. Uh, I'll talk, talk about some of these satellites later and their monitoring mm -hmm. capabilities. And is that what the crew members have been doing, making those preparations, those, those adjustments to it? Uh, no, they haven't adjusted okay. any of these satellites. So we're just in the early stages of demonstrating that these satellites can actually be launched from the space station with this Japanese uh, SSOD, the Small Satellite Orbital Deployer. Okay, we saw a piece of animation here while you were speaking a minute ago that I'm hoping we can get uh, set up to, to run again, because I want to ask okay. you if you can talk us through the deployment procedure and, and tell me how the uh, the crew and the flight controllers on the ground are going to work to uh, to actually set these satellites out into orbit. Well, first let me talk about the GEM airlock and the GEM remote manipulator system, or GEM RMS. The GEM is the Japanese experiment module. It has an airlock which allows the crew to position uh, in this case, the satellite deployer in the airlock when it's, and this is connected and open to the pressurized environment. Then they close the hatch behind the satellite deployer, and then they can depressurize that airlock such that now the, uh, the deployer can slide out into the vacuum of space and be retrieved by the GEM RMS and, and then uh, positioned for deployment. So it, it, to, to recap that, the, the crew members have the satellites inside the station, but they attach it to this slide and through the airlock present it outside so that the Japanese robotic arm can grab it and, and begin to manipulate, put these out to be deployed. Yes, and that's a, it's, it's a choreographed uh, sequence of steps between the ground and Aki Hoshide on the space station. So there's, uh, the way it starts out is uh, Aki will uh, uh, position the satellites on the table and he will then close the hatch such that uh, the, uh, the satellites are now in the uh, airlock and the hatch is closed on the inside. He will then command uh, the airlock to be depressed and he will open the hatch on the outside of the airlock and this is all by commanding. He's not physically doing this right. himself and he will then command the table to slide out. And now it's out in the vacuum of space, and the ground will then command the GEM RMS, a remote manipulator system, much like our uh, space station arm, which, but the space station arm is much bigger. This is a smaller arm 
just on the gym section just for handling external payloads. So the ground uh, SIPSI control uh, at the JAXA Control Center in Scuba near Tokyo will command the gym arm to grapple the extended slide table with the satellite deployer on it. Aki will then release the lock that holds the multi-purpose experiment platform or MPAP on, onto the slide table. And then the RMS, is now it's being commanded from the ground, it extracts that uh, deployer from the, the uh, airlock slide table. Now at this point, Aki uh, retracts the table into the airlock and the GEM RMS then moves to the deploy position for the satellites. The deploy position is pointed 45 degrees away from Nader and retrograde such that it won't interfere with the space station after the satellites are released. What is it that these satellites are going to do? Uh, there, you said there are five satellites. Uh, in, in general, what's the mission of these uh, so satellites once they're deployed? Well, let me talk a little bit about the satellites first. I, as I mentioned, uh, this satellite uh, design has been a standard for over 10 years now, and they are 10 centimeter cubes weighing no more than 1.2 kilograms, or about three pounds. So in this particular case, there are five of these satellites. One of them is actually two of those 10 centimeter cubic units. Uh, each of the, there are two uh, chutes or gem de uh, satellite deployers and three of the 10 centimeter cubes can fit in each chute. The first deployment will be done by Aki, the second deployment will be done by, by the SIPSI ground control. But in this case, uh, the five satellites consist of, uh, I, all of them, uh, with one exception, were designed and built by students at universities. Um, one of them was built by San Jose State University, um, and that's called TechEdSat. And uh, it will, need to refer to my notes here, um, it transmits elapsed time, temperature, voltage, and current, and any error messages that, have in, that the microprocessor has encountered over a ham radio. All of these satellites have uh, solar panels on them to produce power, and they all transmit signals of some sort, in this case, ham radio signals. Another satellite, which is uh, uh, provided by the company called Nanorax, who in turn goes out and gathers customers who want to launch small satellites. In this case, their customer is a Vietnamese university, and that, the students from that university have designed a satellite that will take images of the Earth and possibly capture images of uh, and be able to do ship tracking, detect forest fires, and do atmospheric research. Uh, the other three satellites were designed by Japanese uh, students or, or companies, and one of them that is very interesting is, uh, is the FITSAT. This satellite actually has LEDs on it that flash very brightly, but flashing is the key here because they're not on continuously, they don't consume that much power, but when they are on, they're, they're uh, uh, very bright, so bright that you might be able to see them from ground sites uh, within Japan. They're, uh, they're described as 100 watts of LEDs. Now, a watt is, a, is a, an amount of uh, energy per time unit, so since they're flashing, you really have to take out the time aspect of it. But they're, they're extremely bright, if you know how bright mm -hmm. LEDs can be compared to regular sure. light bulbs. Uh, the second satellite from the uh, uh, from JAXA or from the Japanese side is the, the one that's actually twice as big as any of the others. It's a two-unit satellite, and it transmits Earth images taken with a fisheye lens. Uh, and the, uh, the last satellite uh, from the JAXA side takes infrared pictures of the Earth and transmits those to the ground. It's all going to be uh, interesting to see when it uh, when it happens. Uh, as we mentioned, the uh, plan was that the satellites were going to be deployed uh, tomorrow morning, uh, possibly uh, about this time. Uh, that plan is probably going to change as a result of the uh, ATV not undocking, as well as the planning for a, a possible conjunction. Uh, but uh, it's it's another interesting scientific aspect of what's going on. Very briefly, can give me a, a sense of what we can look forward to in science during uh, Expedition 33 and 34? Well, um, in the near term, I noticed you were talking about the SpaceX Dragon vehicle docking soon. Uh, there are two experiments coming up on that vehicle. 
Uh, one is called Micro 6. This looks at the, uh, the yeast fungus, also known as the thrush uh, uh, fungus, which people can get uh, in their mouths. Uh, it turns out that the yeast fungus is, is actually present on all of our bodies. It's an opportunistic uh, pathogen. It's just waiting for a chance to flourish when a person's immune system becomes compromised. And we know from, from other studies that astronauts' immune system, just because they're uh, uh, out of their natural environment and in a microgravity environment, their immune system does become compromised. So there is, you can understand that there would be a very serious health risk, uh, the yeast uh, uh, infections yeah. uh, in this case. So this experiment actually grows yeast in a microgravity environment and looks at the genetic changes that happen uh, with that yeast growing uh, in a microgravity environment. Another uh, sortie experiment, as we call it, which will go up on the SpaceX vehicle and come down uh, approximately 25 or 30 days later on the same vehicle, uh, looks at uh, plants and their resistance against gravity on the Earth. It turns out this experiment is called resist tubule, and the, the act of resisting the pull of gravity and being able to hold itself up is where the, re the resistance comes from. Uh, the tubule refers to uh, uh, structures inside plant cells that give those cells their strength so that they can resist gravity. So there are Earth applications as well as space applications for this experiment. On Earth, a plant can spend up to 50% of the energy it acquires from the sun just resisting gravity. But as we continue to use genetically modified organisms for our food, plants may not need to spend that much energy resisting gravity because they change their shape and so forth, but they still may grow these, these structures to resist gravity. So if we can control how much energy the plant puts in resisting gravity, we might be able to increase food production for plants on Earth. In space, obviously for long duration uh, trips, it, it would be very desirable to be able to, for the astronauts sure. to grow their own food in space, and that it has space applications also. That's great. We look forward to seeing all of that. Uh, Vic, thanks for coming this morning. I appreciate welcome, it. Pat. Vic Cooley is the uh, lead increment scientist for Expedition 33 and 34. Thank you.